pass in a wave of black depression. One night, as I'm lying in bed, my teeth come back to me. Most of them do, anyway. The left incisor, the ringleader, reeks of liquor and cheap perfume. The right incisor smells like smoke. The left eye tooth smells like the, the outdoors. Perhaps he went camping or something? The wisdom teeth are missing, and I imagine the others had to leave them behind. I wonder if they will ever be back and realize I would not miss them at all. The teeth climb into my mouth, rearranging themselves continuously as if they can't remember where they belong. Once positioned, I'll have to look in the mirror tomorrow to find out if they made it to the right spot. They work themselves back into the partially healed gums. This is a lot more painful than when they had removed themselves. It's so painful, in fact, I pass out. Perhaps, I think, as I slide into blackness, I'll need to get braces to ensure they never escape again. Uh, this next one's called Chainsaw Mouth. A man goes to the dentist and has a chainsaw installed in his mouth. The chainsaw is not something he specifically asked for, it just works out that way. Leaving the dentist's office, he tries to say thank you to the receptionist, but the only sound that comes out is the deafening rev of the chainsaw. He gets home early and decides he can probably get some work done. The man is a salesman. Grabbing his bag of merchandise, he heads out to the neighborhood, going door to door. Whenever he has something new, some kitchen gadget everyone needs, he always starts in his own neighborhood, figuring neighbors with a lot of appliances are happy neighbors indeed. He knocks on Mrs. Frick's door. She lives at the end of the street. He waits impatiently for her to come to the door, shifting anxiously from foot to foot. An inordinate period of time passes, and Mrs. Frick throws open the door. Half of her face is covered in makeup. The other half looks old and wrinkled. The man goes into a spiel, but the only thing coming from his mouth is the grating sound of the chainsaw. Mrs. Frick gasps in horror and backs away from the door. The man holds an arm of comfort out to her, begging her to stay and listen to him. She slams the door in his face, and he reaches into his bag and pulls out some merchandise, leaving it on her doorstep. To his dismay, the merchandise is not some new household appliance. It's a bondage magazine and a snuff film. He wants to reclaim the merchandise, but he's so appalled and frightened that he can't. He scampers off to the next house and repeats the same process, telling himself it can't be that bad. This time, he finds himself throwing child pornography in a crack rock into the home of the retreating Miss Gallup. The day does not get any better. His neighbors become more abrupt and violent, some of them openly hostile. His chainsaw voice becomes louder, more antagonistic. His merchandise becomes even darker and more illegal, Nazi propaganda, body parts. He retreats back to his house, throwing the door shut and locking it. He hides in the closet and crouches down, weeping with his new gasoline-powered voice. Uh, I just have a couple more. Uh, this one's called Napper. A man comes home from work and surveys the living room. Hmm, he muses. I think I'll take a nap. He lies down on the couch, pulls a blanket up around his chin, and immediately falls asleep. His wife throws the closet door open and enters the room. She looks at her husband, napping, snug in his covers, a trickle of drool running from the corner of his mouth, and a look of worry crosses her face. She pulls a chair beside the couch and stares at her sleeping husband. He naps for hours. She wrings her hands in her lap and mutters, I can't live like this. Her worried look turns into one of fear. She stands up and kicks the chair over. She grabs her husband and shakes him violently. I can't live like this, she screams. The man continues napping, dead to the world. She uprights the chair, placing it beside the couch. Again, she sits down and stares at her husband. One day, she says, one day you'll get yours. She decides to turn the television on, but every channel features a close-up of a man sleeping. She <laughs> stares at the remote control held tightly in her hand, and then at the television, her face wrinkled with terror. She hasn't slept for years. It makes her think of death. She wanders around the house and turns all the lights on. She retrieves her cell phone, held hostage by an angry houseplant, and systematically calls the rest of her family, all of them suffering the same affliction as her. They meditate on their sleeping spouses and devise complicated plans to eradicate sleep from society. She hangs up with the final family member, and just when her thoughts turn to the lonely night ahead, her husband wakes up and says, Ah, that was a damn fine nap. She asks if he wants to go out and fuck shit up. Of course, he says. <laughs> of course. He knows that's the only way he'll ever get to sleep tonight. With baseball bats, blow torches, and high-powered flashlights, the couple head out into the cold night. Uh, this is the last one. It's called The Champion of Needham Avenue. The phone rings and a voice blares out without it even being picked up. Shovel fight. Two minutes. I cram some half-rancid salami into my face hole and wipe my greasy lips with the back of my hand. I'm naked and I have to get ready. I pick up my good sweatpants from the floor and slide them on, run my hands over my rotund and hairy torso. I kick in the door to the closet and select my weapon. A light sho snow shovel with an orange plastic head. Not a very good choice, but the only one I have. I step out onto my porch into the brisk late winter air. The neighborhood is already out, enormous families clustered on sagging porches and screaming for blood. I hold the shovel head up, letting it rest on my shoulder. I stroll out into the middle of the street and turn to face the shovel fight champion, Dick Borden.
His shovel is massive and heavy looking, like the man who wields it. It is a gardening shovel with a thick iron head. He snarls and walks toward me as I walk toward him. There is no walking away. Borgum is undefeated. His eyes are huge and bloodshot. I'll give you the first swipe, he growls. I grab my shovel firmly in both hands and take a massive roundhouse swing at his face. The shovel hits him in the ear, and the lobe falls off onto the pavement. Half-hearted, at best. He bends down to pick up the lobe. I bring my shovel down on his massive back. He is unfazed. He tosses the lobe to the adoring crowd, takes his shovel in both massive hands, and crouches down like a batter at a baseball game. I quickly take another swipe at his face. The tip of his nose goes shooting off to his right. He whips his shovel around and catches me in the ribs. All my wind is gone. Something has to be broken in there. I land a couple more blows, weakly. They only leave red marks on him. I turn my shovel and strike down with the sight of it. A small chunk of his scalp comes off, but there isn't any blood. I suddenly have the feeling I'm not going to win this. The champion of Needham Avenue raises his shovel above his head and brings it down on the top of my skull. My head splits in half. Objects fly out. A small airplane, a fingernail clipper, some candy. <laughs> Haphazardly, I begin spinning in circles, swinging my shovel around and around as though this will ward him off. He approaches rapidly, swinging his shovel across my body. My torso splits open, unleashing more of these strange objects. Children rush down from the porches to grab up these seemingly incongruent items. Their mothers caution them to watch out for the swinging shovels. But I cast mine aside, a sign of defeat and surrender. My body is so split apart, it's hard to stand. Borgum swings his shovel at the approaching children, telling them to drop the objects. It's like this every time. The children, most of them anyway, are so terrified, they drop the objects as soon as they pick them up. A few mischievous punks stuff the objects into their pockets and run back to their protective mothers. I stare vacantly as Borgum uses his shovel to scoop up the small amount of objects, and it occurs to me what they are. All of my dreams, all of my ideas, all hope and joy are now in the process of entering Borgum's heavy burlap pockets. He'll take them home and give them to his wife. She will prepare a nice supper with them, and then, sitting down, they, were de they will devour all of this mental content until they are full, only to defecate it out sometime the next day. I do not even have the energy to pick up my shovel. I head back to the house, trying to hold my body back together. I suppose I'll have to call the doctor. Once in the house, I reach down into my legs, feeling for more objects. Sadly, the left leg is filled with pain, and the right leg is filled with depression. I do the same to my arms and find the left one filled with addiction and the right filled with madness. I put it all into the garbage disposal, and at the end of my right big toe, I find it, the one dream I've been saving. I pull a box of dirt from the freezer and bury the dream. Come spring, there will be many more, and I'll have to begin training all over again. Thank you.